Good morning. Good morning and welcome. My name is Lisa Hetfield. I'm the interim director for the Institute for Women's Leadership Consortium. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the first symposium of the Gloria Steinem Program in Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies. I feel the same way. Today's symposium, The New Normal, Women, Media, and Politics, began with a conversation last night. A conversation between Farai Chidea, Rebecca Traster, moderated by Michelle Martin. I have been hearing from you this morning, those of you who were there, and those of you who watched it on Facebook. Some of the words I've collected are amazing, intense, Stunning, terrifying, <laughs> refreshing, therapeutic, and my all-time favorite from Dean Potter, electrifying. <laughs> we can't wait for today. The conversation continues. If you missed it, you can watch it live, not live, you can watch it streaming on Facebook. You also can should know that we're live streaming this program and you should do whatever it is I'm supposed to say. Share. Share, thank you, with your social media networks. Do that right now. We had over 3,000 people watching last night. So it's pretty exciting, especially with the kind of conversation we were having. Before I introduce Bobby Brown, who will introduce Gloria Steinem, I want to thank... Well, I really want to celebrate a group of people whose commitment and hard work over several years have made all of this possible. I think of these people as the yes people. These are the ones who, when asked to do something ambitious and bold, say yes, and they mean it. The most incredible yes person is Gloria Steinem. It was almost five years ago when our late director, Alison Bernstein, approached Gloria with the idea for the first ever chair to bring together media, culture, and feminist studies. And it was Alison's idea that the chair should be named for Gloria. And she asked Gloria to endorse the Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair. Gloria said yes. And she didn't say, yes, you go for it. She said, yes, this is important. I'm all in. I'll help you every step of the way. And she was true to her word. Thank you. <laughs> then Allison went to two outstanding women leaders, Jerry Laybourne and Suba Barry and asked them to co-chair the campaign to raise $3 million, the minimum needed to endow this chair. They didn't say, mm, how long will it take? What's the plan? Who's on board? They said, this is urgent. We need this now. We're going to do it. They were followed by a chorus of yeses. Some of you are in the room. And those women, those leaders in media and across fields of activism, all said yes to joining the Gloria Steinem <clears throat> Endowed Chair Steering Committee. And they have continued to say yes over the years we've been working to reach our goal. When we've asked them to reach out again and to keep going and to take us to the goal, <clears throat> they say yes. We put the question to leading foundations the Ford Foundation, the John and James L. Knight Foundation, not only did they say yes to giving to the endowment, but they gave program money to make this program possible. And then the Henry Luce Foundation added their yes to supporting this program today. 
now 10 foundations and over 350 donors have all said yes to helping to make this happen. Now, truth in advertising, we still need a few more yeses. So we'll be talking to you about that later. And there was no shortage of yeses on the Rutgers side. We went to the Rutgers leadership, we went to the Dean of the School of Communication and Information, Arts and Sciences, the Department of Women's and Gender Studies, all said yes. And they didn't say yes, but, they said yes, and we're, we'll support you. And more than that, once we get the chair, we'll keep supporting you. Amazingly, when we reached out to plan this event, and wanted the very top journalists, the very best thinkers, to be part of an amazing conversation, an electrifying conversation, they said yes. Even though two days ago they were in Chicago or DC or Mississippi, they came and they said yes, thank you so much for being here. The yes people who put this event together are so many, I just couldn't possibly mention them all. But faculty, staff, students from the Institute for Women's Leadership, the Center for American Women in Politics, the Department of Women's and Gender Studies, all have worked so hard. And I, couldn't, I wouldn't feel right if I didn't call out Rachel Bernstein and Emily Heron, who just are the greatest young yes people ever. And as if that weren't enough, last month, Jerry Laybourne had breakfast with Bobby Brown. And before they finished the conversation, I think Bobby said at least three yeses. Yes, she would join the committee. Yes, she would help us get the word out. Yes, she would support this important work. We're so pleased you're here today with us, Bobby. And it is my privilege now to introduce you. I'm going to read a little from your bio, which is so very well written. Bobby Brown changed the face of cosmetics in 1991 when she launched Bobby Brown Essentials. I remember. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> Through her unique approach to beauty and her ability to translate the latest trends into wearable, real life looks, a sought after global beauty expert and a New York Times bestseller. Bobby's impact extends beyond beauty and fashion. She was a recipient of Glamour's Women of the Year and has been inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame. Let's just say she is a Jersey girl with Rutgers connections. How could she go wrong? Uh, she currently holds three honorary degrees. And I would like to say that I first I heard you when you came to Douglas to speak, Bobby. It was packed, packed with students, people from the community. Bobby is a great storyteller. And she has a way of bringing us all in and making friends. And if you, I recommend you follow her on Instagram, which I've been doing. It seems like a nonstop party of empowering women all day, every day. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you so much. Yikes. yikes, I thought I was nervous enough. It's like, yikes. So first of all, yes, I am a born again New Jersey person. I'm on my tiptoes, so I get to work my, you know, my buttocks while I'm actually <laughs> speaking to you guys because I'm very short. Um, so I'm born again, New Jersey. I'm from Chicago, but I've chosen New Jersey. So I really love the state and I love Rutgers. My husband graduated from here, got his law degree from here. We go to all the games. We have courtside seats. So I'm really, really proud to be here. And if anyone ever said to me in a million years, one day when you grow up, you are going to be there introducing Gloria Steinem, I would have said, yeah, right. <laughs> so here goes. As someone that has spent her career empowering women to be the best versions of themselves, I am so proud to introduce the remarkable woman who started the movement. Gloria Steinem is an icon and a national treasure. I told her she reminds me of my friend Yogi because he was my other national treasure, who has empowered us all for decades. I first met Gloria at the White House for a women's lunch hosted by Michelle Obama. I instantly 
beelined over to introduce myself as every woman in this room did today, okay? But now I got to witness what it's like for Gloria to watch everyone run over to her. She is a woman of so much accomplishment, but she is humble. She's present. When she talks to you, she's right there. And she's nice, and on top of all that, she's friggin' gorgeous. <laughs> I offered to do her makeup anytime, and she kindly responded, only if I could come in and name your products. Sorry I never took you up on this. I have no products right now. Gloria Steinem is a writer, lecturer, political activist, feminist organizer, and leading media spokeswoman on issues of inequality. I'm probably left out a few things because there's so many. In 1972, she co-founded Ms. Magazine and remained one of its editors for 15 years before she helped to found New York Magazine, where she was a political columnist and wrote feature articles. She has been published in countless publications, produced a documentary on child abuse for HBO, a feature film about the death penalty for Lifetime, and has been the subject of profiles on Showtime, Lifetime, and too many more to mention. Her books, they're 10, 12, I don't even... I, no, yes, nine, I counted, and I'm not good at math. Her many books included the bestsellers, and I, I'm not mentioning all of them because there was too many, My Life on the Road, Revolution from Within, A Book of Self-Esteem, Outrageous Acts, and Everyday Rebellions, Moving Beyond Words, Marilyn, Norma Jean on the Life of Marilyn Monroe, and in India, As If Women Matter. Gloria has been the subject of three television documentaries, including HBO's Gloria, in her own words, and she is among the subjects of the 2013 PBS documentary Makers, a continuing project to record the women who made America. She is also host and executive producer of the Emmy-nominated Vice Series Woman. Are you kidding, Gloria? In November 2013, President Barack Obama awarded Gloria Steinem the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. And now Gloria is the inspiration for our dream to create the Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair in Media Culture and Feminist, uh oh, they wrote it on the next page, Studies. <laughs> Today is a preview of the kinds of programs that Chair will make possible. I believe that being strong and confident is the true meaning of beauty. I'm so proud to welcome a woman who embodies both. Please welcome Gloria Steinem. Thank you, Bobby, for making body decoration okay. <laughs> I think of you when I look at the great photographs of the Omo people. Uh -huh. Have you ever seen these? You should Google them if you haven't. In the Omo Valley in Africa, and women and men alike decorate themselves beautifully with colors and leaves and flowers every day. You know, our body decoration is a natural thing, but we sometimes are made to feel we should hide rather than express, right? And you help us express. Uh, and also, you've always used older women, I just want to say. <laughs> right. <laughs> so thank you. And, and also, I want to say to all of you who are just something like 50, 60 years younger than me, <laughs> something like that, imagine how you would feel if you looked forward and had a chair named after you. I mean, that's the way I feel. I mean, hello? You know? I just wish the government professor who gave me a C plus on a paper about <laughs> um, Anyway, dear friends, it means a lot to me and to each of us who has worked hard to make today happen, and I thank all of you. It's been a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of work to make this day happen. Um, and each of you has taken time out of your busy lives to meet together for the first ever meeting of the joining of media studies with feminist studies, black studies, Latin American studies, Native American studies, LGBT studies, all that I would rather call remedial studies. 
In other words, an effort to explore media and message together and to figure out in an open and exploratory way how to more accurately reflect our lives and the world to create media that look and sound like this country and are not just centered in this and a few other countries. Of course, we've always had media since time immemorial, from the songs and stories and chants and drums around the campfire when this North America was still called Turtle Island, to the town crier and Benjamin Franklin's printing press and the songs and signals and oral histories of the enslaved Africans and indentured servants, from the newspapers and shortwave radio of immigrant groups in their own languages to the mass newspaper headlines of Pulitzer and Hearst, from the Twitter and Google age that made some of us fear organizing in real life would be confused with just pressing send, <laughs> to the big relief of the biggest march ever on Washington, echoed around the world. And the cause, <laughs> and, the cause and effect between pressing send and showing and showing up, those two things became seamless. We may be, as Dickens said right now, in the best of times and the worst of times, <laughs> uh, but there is cause to be awakened and we are woke and we are going to stay woke. <laughs> we have all kinds of media and we also have all kinds of myths about media. For instance, we think that printed histories are more accurate than oral ones when that has not always been proven true, often, usually, the other way around. Many people saying what they actually saw have often been way more accurate than the winners of a war who dictated history. This should give us more faith in the multi-sourcing of the web, except that sometimes this is an electronic repetition of a source of alternate facts. Also, success is measured by the number of hits, not by fact-checking. That is also because advertisers reward the number of readers, viewers, and hits not the fact-checking score, which, I have to say, is not all that smart because research shows that ads are more trusted when they are seen or read or heard in a trusted source. All right, if we just pointed out that single fact with enough forcefulness and enough consumer dollars, we as media consumers and media makers could have a great and helpful and revolutionary impact. Of course, there has always been suppression of the news, always, from the concealing of slave rebellions because they were contagious, to the rule that a uh, proper woman, that is a white woman, her name could only appear in the newspaper when she was born, when she married, and when she died. And there have always been bringers of facts from the abolitionists who wrote down slave narratives and awakened the conscience of allies to the evidence or racist, of racist police brutality recorded on iPhones and, spread, and that spread Black Lives Matter and outraged allies. Now we may be returning to the greater accuracy of oral history with the ability to record on iPhones and body cameras. Yet even our journalistic practice still often remains bound by an old technology. For instance, the telegraph machine gave birth to the who, what, where, why, when uh, formula that is still often taught in journalism schools. Before that, when Winston Churchill and many others were writing, the point was to put the reader where the reporter was, and stories were written in narrative or essay form. From, but then along came the telegraph machine, and basic facts had to be in the first paragraph, more detailed in each subsequent paragraph, so that a story could be cut off from the bottom and still be complete. 
This limited who, what, where, why, when, inverted pyramid is still being practiced, leaving many media consumers starved for narrative. After all, we have spent millennia sitting around campfires telling our stories, our brains are organized on narrative and image, and we are starved for them. Sometimes I think this part, this is part of the reason for celebrity culture. Celebrities are the only narrative in town. And if you really want to be worried about the media, consider that in this country alone, there are more than four times more public relations professionals than journalists. And also that the average PR person earns more by far than the average journalist. As of 2014, according to the US Department of Labor, there were 4.6 PR people for every single reporter. In other words, people are more likely to be employed and rewarded for shaping or concealing facts than for uncovering them. And of course, under the Trump administration, even the Department of Labor may cease putting out those statistics that tell us there are more PR people than journalists. But we're less likely to fall for the idea of old, gender-divided, race-divided, class-divided cultures. We're less likely now to think that there are only two sides to every question, when in fact there may be three, or five, or even more sides. Consider what a false equivalency of two-sided balance brought us in the coverage of the recent presidential election. A mostly inaccurate side got the same time and space as a mostly accurate side, and the reporter's job was supposed to be done. Yet as Christian Amanpour pointed out, a journalist's job is not to be even-handed and balanced, it is to be accurate. I celebrate that more and more journalists and more and more bloggers and Facebookers and tweeters and protesters are taking on accuracy as their goal. We also uh, think, uh, we think more about the delights and dilemmas of language. One group's terrorist is another group's freedom fighter. So an accurate alternative word might be insurgent. A phrase like alternative lifestyle assumes that a norm exists or that people have lifestyles instead of lives. <laughs> Expressions like the black problem or the Jewish problem turn the victim into the problem literally when white racism or anti-Semitism would better describe what is going on. Also, we're now questioning that the dominant group takes the noun while the lesser group requires an adjective. There are poets and Latina or Latino poets, pilots and women pilots, athletes and gay athletes, but we're beginning to suggest that everyone has an adjective or no one has an adjective. If there is a trans, where there is transgender, there is cisgender and so on. To avoid Latino, Latina, for instance, there is now Latinx, a consciousness raiser, if nothing else, right? <laughs> and if you think our current language based on, in, on inventions of gender and race, and they are inventions, is inevitable, just remember that the people once sitting around a campfire, a campfire where we are now at this very moment in time, were probably speaking a language that didn't have gendered pronouns like he and she. People were people. What a concept. One of the great rewards of beginning to look at history when people started is this. Much of what we want once was here. So we begin to have faith that we can create it again. OK, this was just my little morning exercise in throwing all the cards in the air <laughs> and making it okay to talk and think openly, to tell our own stories and listen to the stories of others, to challenge 
and invent and to ask, what if? The media are our current, ex current campfire. If only some groups are sitting around it, we are all missing the whole story. When Alison Bernstein suggested this combination of media and message, I'm not sure that either of us understood just how crucial this would soon become. False and alternate facts had yet to loom so large in our lives. For instance, I was still criticizing ferociously the New York Times. Of course, I'm going, not going to stop because we always hold to a higher standard that which we respect the most. But now I'm more aware of just how valuable the fact-checked New York Times is. I'm now paying for my subscription <laughs> <laughs> instead of getting it mostly free online. Also, I hadn't made some generational trips that showed me just how polarizing technology can be. After all, some people are literate and some are not, which has absolutely nothing to do with intelligence. It has only to do with race and gender and geography and poverty. Some areas have electricity and some do not. Some people are in refugee camps while others are building walls. Every advance in technology can be even more divisive if it is not democratized. Watch out in this world for the tech libertarians who think that their ideas and profit motive can solve everything and that government has no role. Now the media, our precious and life-sustaining talking circle, is our path to emphasis to, is our path to empathy and governance and even survival on this spaceship Earth. I think this is way more crucial than Allison or I ever imagined five years ago. But if you're feeling overwhelmed, as we all are, here are two things, simple things, that have helped me. First, I look up and I know I feel powerless. So instead, I look laterally out at you and at each other. If we look at each other, then we know we have power together. Second, it's become more and more clear to me with advancing age <laughs> that the end doesn't justify the means, the means are the ends. The means we choose dictate where we are going to get. So if today we spend as much time listening as talking, and vice versa, we will come away both having taught and learned. If we make today an example of the inclusion and accuracy and openness we want in the future, and yes, the laughter we want in the future, then we will be on our way. And I want to leave you, how am I doing on my 30 minutes? I'm over? Okay, well, I'll leave you with a short word <laughs> about, about laughter because it's an interesting measure of ourselves where we are in our media. It turns out that laughter, as the cultures who were here in the first place knew, is the only free emotion. You can compel fear, of course, you can also compel love if people are kept captive and dependent for long enough. We come to believe that we are in love, we enmesh in order to survive. But you can't compel laughter. It happens when two things come together and suddenly make a third. It happens when you learn something. It happens when you understand something for the first time. So this is a pretty good measure of our lives and yes, also of our media. If you're someplace where they won't let you laugh, get out. <laughs> <laughs> if we have media that impose generalities and not narrative and detail and laughter, change it. 
and that spontaneous expression of freedom will guide us today and for the rest of our work. Thank you.